Uh oh. Sorry, I forgot to turn off my other speaker. And hey, how is everybody? Crystal, how are you? I'm doing good. All right. Gavin, you doing all right? Yes, sir. Doing pretty good. Did you watch the uh, YouTube for Tuesday? A lot of information there. Yeah, I haven't yet. I'm going to take a listen to that probably after this class is finished. All right. Yeah, make sure that you do. It was, it's kind of long and important. But uh, today we're going to cover turbochargers. And um, uh, uh, they have a lot, a lot of things involved with turbochargers, but we're going to try to make it simple so you guys can understand it. Um, there's some uh, pages in your... Um, canvas that are pretty good. I think they cover it quite well. And so let me start a screen share here. This is it. And the problem is, why is that? Why did that pick it up in the middle of the... Hmm, I shouldn't have picked it up in the middle. Okay. So turbochargers, there's several different types of turbochargers that we're dealing with. They're uh, fixed geometry and wastegated. We don't, Ford does not have any fixed geometry. Um, when I say that, that's not true. We have fixed geometry turbos, but all of our fixed geometry turbos are wastegated turbochargers. And then we have variable geometry turbochargers. So we're gonna kind of explain what that means as we go along here. So we're gonna cover um, what turbochargers are. We're gonna, we're gonna go through kind of the basics of turbochargers with uh, you know, fixed geometry and, and you know, just kind of how they work. And then, and then from there, we'll get into uh, how they wastegate them and then, and then the variable geometry. And then we have a uh, we have series turbochargers. Uh, we use parallel turbochargers in our gas engines, but we don't have any parallel turbochargers in our um, in our diesel in our diesel engines. And then we have um, a single sequential in the six sevens from 2011 to 2014. Kind of a complicated turbo, um, but uh, we had it nonetheless. So we're going to kind of cover all that tonight and hopefully be able to understand how it all works. Arturo, welcome. Yeah. Um, you missed Monday night or Tuesday night. I did post a, I did post the video of that up there. Um, probably worth watching. It's got some pretty good animations and crystal. I did put, I did put a, uh, all the animations on a PowerPoint in, in there. So you can see all those again. Thank you. You're welcome. I, you know what? I didn't go back. I, I, I'll go back and do that with the Huey ones too. I don't think I did that with the Hueys, but okay. I, I will do that with the Hueys. Okay. So the purpose of turbochargers is to supply additional air for combustion. Um, I'll just read this slide. Uh, using exhaust gases to drive a centrifugal pump um, helps to enhance engine operating efficiency, and we can ultimately make more power out of a smaller engine. And that's what we're doing these days. In the older days, they used to just make more power out of big engines. But now we're taking and turbocharging, you know, very small engines and getting a lot of horsepower out of them and because we can just make them more efficient. Okay. Um, we're affecting uh, engine emissions, noise characteristics, uh, fuel economy, and power, all as a result of turbocharging engines. Um, and the difference between um, the only engine that I know that was non-turbocharged and turbocharged was we went back to the old 7.3 IDI days. They were, you know, super slow, sluggish pigs. But as soon as you turbocharged them, I mean, you just instantly, you know, gave them 
you know, 30 to 50 more horsepower, much more efficient running engine. Okay. Um, the whole concept of it is the fact that an engine, as it, as it, uh, remember the term volumetric efficiency last semester in the, in the gas engine class, there's a, there comes a point to in an engine where there's only so much air inside that cylinder. Okay. And in, on a naturally aspirated engine, we're really only going to be able to scavenge about 85% of the uh, charge air out of there. So there's a limited amount of air that we can put in that cylinder. So with that limited amount of air in that cylinder, we can only put so much fuel in that, in that thing. So if we put more air in, we could put more fuel in. Putting more fuel in means we're going to get more power and more torque out of that um, particular cylinder. So that's the purpose of turbochargers is to be able to cram more air in there. Okay. If more air is packed into the combustion chamber along with additional fuel, we obviously going to get more power. Um, higher cylinder pressures translate into more torque. And uh, so a turbocharger is nothing more than a, a air pump that's driven by the exhaust. Okay. Uh, they're technically a supercharger. A supercharger though, however, is a, is a usually a belt driven, somehow it's mechanically driven from the engine itself. They have their advantages, but they have their disadvantages as well. A, 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 a blower, which we would call a supercharger, if um, they don't, they can't build a lot of boost at, at slower speeds where we can, on a turbocharger, we can build through variable geometry and some other things and changing the size of the turbocharger, we can get more air to the cylinder quicker. Um, that's not always true because you know, we have a problem called turbo lag, but we'll talk about that here in a minute. Um, we already talked about that. Okay, so here's here's just the basics of a turbocharger. And if, if you guys kind of know how they work, I, I, I don't want to be redundant, and but we're going to go through this from its basics and then and then build up because how they work is, is quite interesting. We're going to just kind of show it here and then we'll explain what that's what it means. And I'm not sure why they used red for the cold air and blue for the hot air, but they did here. So air is going to come in the engine here and it's going to pass through this compressor wheel. It's going to go into the cylinders and as the exhaust goes out, it's collected, the exhaust is going to, for all intents and purposes, and it doesn't do this, but it, it blows on that turbine wheel and it turns it. It's kind of like, has anybody ever taken an air hose to a bearing or, or anything, anything like that and spun it with it or with a garden hose or something like that? Um, we're just going to spin this turbine wheel with the exhaust and that turbine wheels attached by a shaft here and it's going to turn the compressor wheel. So the faster the turbine spins, the faster the compressor wheel spins and it pushes more air into the cylinders. Okay. The, the compressor wheel is nothing more than a uh, centrifugal pump, just like a water pump. Uh, a water pump is a, um, just as it spins, the way the fins are on here, um, they just push air out. They pull air in in the, in the uh, center here in the inducer and they push it out of the exducer and it just makes pressure, okay? How much pressure it makes is going to be dependent upon the speed of the turbine, the size of the compressor wheel, the size of the turbine wheel, the how they fit in the housing. There's you know there's a whole lot of factors that are going to build into it, but those are all kind of engineered from the factory. You know the manufacturers engineer things to make them as efficient as they need to for each particular engine. Now, what I just told you is is just a very basic understanding of how a turbocharger operates. However, um, as we get into here, it, it's, it gets a little bit more complicated than that. Okay. Um, so supplying additional air to the cylinders is the turbocharger's main purpose, but there are other things that, that um, come into play that are kind of unintended consequences of it, okay? Um, they improve power. We can uh, 
um, helps us be able to get higher than atmospheric pressure inside there. It's gonna help us with our volumetric efficiency. In other words, we're, we're flushing that cylinder out. The volumetric efficiency on a, uh, on a um, turbocharger is we can go, we can have as much as 150% uh, efficiency and even more in some, in, in some instances, okay? Um, so the other thing that turbochargers can help us do is to help us uh, uh, normalize um, um, atmosphere, okay? So if we go to, let me see if it's in here. Um, well, it's like, I, I think I'll talk about it here in a second. Um, altitude, okay, when we go into, if we go into uh, high altitude situa situations, we have less air available to us in high altitude situations. And that's where turbochargers kind of got their, their beginnings was aircraft during World War I and World War II, you know, they could only go so high because they would run out of air. So they just, they just determined that if they could turbocharge airplane engines, they could go much higher in altitude because then they, they could start pushing air in there. Because remember, it's, the higher we go in, in altitude, the air becomes less dense. We have less oxygen available to us. Turbocharger wheels start to speed up um, because of the higher altitudes and we can put more pressure into the cylinders and, and compensate for um, that low um, pressures at altitude. It's called normalization. But let's go back here to, uh, I, I got ahead of myself. Um, serious turbochargers can boost as much as 65 PSI. I don't personally, I've never seen anything if if, if you took an automotive application and boosted 65 PSI, you'd be replacing a whole lot of head gaskets, head bolts, and broken parts. Uh, we usually run a six liters, a 7.3 is gonna run about 16 and 19 PSI. A six liter is gonna run somewhere, depending on which year it is, gonna run between 21 and 24 PSI. Uh, you're gonna see in the, in the low 20s, um, most of the six sevens, uh, but we're not, we're not pushing uh, 65 PSI through our series turbos in the 6.4. Um, so um, detonation, one of the problems, we'll just kind of put this as a general thing in there, that diesel engines don't experience detonation, spark knock or pinging like a gas engine would. One of the problems that gas engines have is the more pressure we put in the cylinder, the because remember that we're putting more pressure in there, we're also putting more heat. More heat in an air fuel mixture in a gas engine causes the um, air fuel mixture to pre-ignite or to detonate. So they have to have much higher um, fuel um, uh, octane levels in their fuel and, and lots of problems with uh, that. But with a gas or with a diesel engine, we do not experience that because remember, all we are compressing is air. We're not, the, the fuel gets put in after the fact. So diesels are not limited by any stretch of the imagination by uh, how much boost we can put in them. So um, so emissions reductions. So we can start playing because we have the extra air available to us. We have the ability to really lower hydrocarbons, particulate matter and, and carbon monoxide make them really clean. The flip side of that, the downside of that though, is we end up with higher knocks because of uh, higher boost pressures and stuff. But we can, we're gonna combat those in some other ways. And we're gonna talk about EGR next Tuesday. And uh, one of, that's one of the ways we're gonna uh, combat it. But um, so we talked about uh, altitude. Okay, so turbochargers are gonna convert exhaust energy into mechanical energy. So how, how do we do that? The energy from the exhaust it is, is what's producing the power. So I think I have a picture. So the exhaust, as it leaves the cylinders, and this is important to get your head around. As the exhaust leaves the cylinders, all the expansion of that exhaust has not yet taken place there's still some unburnt fuel and the gases are still expanding as it comes out. As it works its way through narrow exhaust ports, 
and exhaust manifolds and, and all the tubing and everything to get to the turbocharger, it's still, all that expansion is still very trapped inside there. And as we bring it into the turbine housing, it's gonna go through a nozzle. I think I have a picture of it here, okay? We'll go through the pieces of this here in a minute. But as the exhaust travels through the snail shell inside here, it's gonna be squeezed down to a nozzle right here. Now, I don't, I wanna confuse you with this, but think about a garden hose. And if you're, if you just have a garden hose just open, it just runs the water out. But if you put your thumb over it, you can spray it harder, correct? So we're gonna do the same thing here with a nozzle inside the um, turbocharger. It's and it nozzles nothing more on a fixed turbocharger than a, than a cast, part of the casting in here. And that exhaust is gonna start, um, is, is it gonna start expanding against this turbine wheel. So what moves the turbine wheel is not the pressure of the exhaust blowing across it. Like you would think if you're blowing on a, you know, the little, the little fans in a, um, in the yard that the wind blows and you kind of blow on them and they kind of spin. It is not, it is not a wind or, or exhaust pressure, um, blowing across it that spins it. It is the expansion of the gas as those exhaust gases come out, they start to expand. Okay. So, if you think about it here on the outlet of this turbine wheel going to the exhaust, that is for all intents and purposes, atmospheric pressure. So you have all this pressure build up inside the uh, volute, uh, volute in here. And this nozzle right there, it, the gases come out of there and start expand. They can expand to their, and they start losing temperature right there. You'll see a big temperature drop right as those gases start to expand. And it says expansion of gases that drive the turbine wheel. Okay. That is an important concept for you to understand. It is not, it is not pressure like air blowing across it or anything like that. It's the expansion of those gases. Okay. And the more heat, that we're putting in the cylinders, the more fuel we're putting in the cylinders, the more heat we're putting in the exhaust and the more heat and, and pressure, all that expansion, that's what speeds it up and makes it go faster and faster and faster. Okay. That is what's happening. And you can see in this picture here, the, the progression of temperatures as this thing, the gases coming out of the exhaust manifold are only 650 degrees. They enter the turbo and go through the volute. And by the time they get to the nozzle, they're like 900 degrees. We, because we are compressing that gas, making it hotter. Okay. So then as it expands and hits that turbine wheel and, and expands and releases into atmospheric pressure, look at the temperature drop we have from, from going into that turbocharger and coming out. We lost almost 500 degrees across that turbine wheel. Okay, that's why they can know the speed of a turbine wheel, of how fast the turbo is turning by its by the temperature. And a lot of uh, larger applications, um, they will put actually put temperature probes on the exhaust so they can know how what it, what the temperature is. And you'll see you'll see a lot of uh, aftermarket. Uh, like really common in the six liters, they would put uh, aftermarket gauge sets in there and they'd put an exhaust probe in the exhaust and, and have a temperature gauge, but they're checking the temperature clear down on the exhaust manifold, not at the turbocharger. And, and it's, if you're going to, if you're going to watch turbocharger temperatures, you need to watch the temperature on the turbocharger and, and, and know this, you're going to know the, basically the speed of the turbocharger based on its heat. And so if they start getting around 1300 degrees, that turbocharger is way overspinning itself and it become it can become a problem. Um, just, just to give you a little perspective on how fast a um, turbocharger can spin. Uh, some of them will, some of the smaller ones will spin up to 180,000 RPMs. That's 180,000 times a minute. That's 30 I believe if you do the math on that, isn't that 
30 times a second. That's, that's like crazy, crazy fast. So that, that is how a turbocharger gets its power is from the expanding gases across that, across the, where'd it go? Across the turbine wheel here. And then that just, all that does is drive the, the compressor wheel and the compressor wheel does the exact same thing. The compressor uh, turbine wheel does, it just does it backwards. So, so just since we're looking at this picture, let's, let's talk about this. So this is called the volute and it is, a, it is in the shape of a snail shell. Turbine chargers are always kind of round and they're in the shape of a snail shell. Okay, the snail shell is called the volute. The nozzle is the part where the gases actually come out and expand and hit on the turbine wheel. We have a turbine wheel. The turbine wheel is going to be uh, broken into two, two parts. The part that drives it up here is called the inducer. And as the exhaust leaves the turbine wheel, it leaves the, it goes through the exducer. And that really is not that big a deal to you, but I'm just giving you the information here. Uh, the turbo is going to be uh, either on a floating bearing. We'll we'll talk about that a little bit, or a ball bearing, and then it just just straight drives this. It does the exact same thing. All the pieces are the same. You have a volute, and you'll have a um, ah. Th this is called something else, and I can't remember what it is. Uh, but your air is going to go. Uh, it's going to get pulled in here and the wheels uh, backwards, it's gonna call, the inducer is gonna be the part in the front here, and the air is just gonna be slung centrifugally and put out by the exducer and just pushed into, through this uh, opening here that has a name that I can't remember. And, uh, and then it goes out to the volute, and then the volute ultimately has an outlet port that's gonna have some sort of hosing or something that's gonna go to the intake manifold. That is a turbocharger in its in its basic form and we don't have a lot of basic turbochargers anymore but that's that is how a turbocharger operates whether it's in a whether it's in a, a you know in a itty bitty little car or all the way up to a you know big giant stationary you know generator or something they're all the same they're all the basic parts are going to be the same okay i alluded to a to a um term earlier called turbo lag and, and anybody who starts talking about turbochargers will 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 always have that term turbo lag <clears throat> and what is it well turbo lag is a phenomenon in the, if you, as the operator of the vehicle stomps on the throttle and the uh, it takes time if you think about it for the turbocharger to to start spooling up in other words he puts the throttle on, we put more fuel in the cylinder, the cylinder starts to move, um, then, the, the, then the heat comes out of the cylinder, it hits the turbocharger, it starts to speed up. That, that takes time, it doesn't happen instantly, okay? And so they call, that is called turbo lag. They can compensate for turbo lag by putting more fuel in this, you know, having strategies that are gonna put more fuel in, but if we put more fuel in too quick, we end up with, uh, puffs of black smoke because we don't have the air available to us. So we, we have an, a, um, uh, a, an emissions issue. So we don't want to, we don't want to do that. Um, some turbo lag is just, is normal, but if there's too much turbo lag, uh, it's perceived by the operator as, Hey, this, this thing has no power. Um, I will tell you that on our 6.7 liter engines in a, in our cabin chassis, we call those our, our narrow frame engines that are in a, um, anything in a big trucks and stuff like that. They actually have them strategy, the strategy of them and the turbocharger on them are such that they have a great deal of turbo lag. They build their, they build their boost very slowly. And the purpose that they do that for is because if you're, if you have the, the same, if you took the same engine and put it in a little vehicle or a big vehicle and you start, you know, and you're trying to pull around, you know, 15,000 plus pounds of, of big work truck or something like that. And you start giving that thing that instant boost and, and everything, it really works the engine hard and it, and it, and it really diminishes the longevity of the engine. 
we had lots of problems with the 6.4 because it gave lots of boost pretty quick and and it just destroyed the engines in those big work trucks so they in the 6.7 they bring the they they just build the boost a lot slower um so just if you took a if you took a work truck and a regular pickup truck and and put them next to each other and both pulled away from the intersection the big work truck's going to take a lot longer to get across the intersection but as soon as he's across that intersection all that boost gets there and he's got all the power he needs to do what he needs to do it's just going to take him a little bit longer but 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 that's what turbo lag is all about and this is just a it's it's a phenomenon called spooling and that spooling is just how fast the turbocharger can get to the speeds it needs in order to make the boost that it needs and they you know they try to they try on all other applications to minimize that that spooling so that it can happen quickly so that we don't end up with a whole bunch of turbo lag but if you were to take one of one of the complaints that always came from people with a six liter was they would if you were if say you needed to jump on a curb or something like that you could you you could pull your six liter up against a curb and then try to pull up on it instead of rolling up on it and jumping on it if you had that stop there and tried to try to get over it 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 was it was the the truck which had lots and lots of horsepower and plenty of horsepower to do it it struggled to get off that up that curb from a dead stop because it took time for that turbo to spool in the way it built its horsepower it, it took some time, but, but then it would eventually just jump and grab it. But it was, people complained about it, but I don't think anybody designed that engine to jump curbs. It wasn't, it wasn't it's in the plan. Um, we talked about all of that. Okay, so types of turbochargers that are out there. There's fixed geometry, which that's what we've just kind of seen a picture of is a fixed geometry. When we say fixed geometry, it means that it's all, it's one size. It doesn't change. The turbo that the, the compressor housing is one size and the, and the um, turbine housing is just one size. It doesn't, it, it, it can't change. Okay, we have waste gated turbos. Well, waste gated turbo is gonna be a fixed geometry turbo with a uh, basically a bypass where we can bypass the, the turbine wheel and, and affect boost. And we'll cover that here in a minute. We have variable, variable geometry turbos. Everything we're using these days in the diesels have variable geometry. In other words, now we're changing the size of the turbocharger and in the, in the turbine side. And we'll, we'll have a whole bunch of stuff. We'll talk about that. We have parallel turbocharging, which is like our uh, 3.5 Echo Boosts and, and the two sevens in our gas engines. They just use two turbochargers um, that are that work in parallel with each other. And then we have um, series turbochargers, which we have in our 6.4 in our in our 4.5. We'll talk about that here in a little while. But if you have a, a you have a a low pressure turbo and a high pressure turbo, and they feed through each other. And then we have a single sequential turbocharger, um, which is uh, what we have in our 6.7, and then an asymmetrical uh, turbocharger, which we don't use and we won't talk about. Um, <clears throat> so there are turbochargers. We just talked about that, fixed geometry turbochargers that have some, some have boost controls and some don't. So the the disadvantages of just a regular fixed turbocharger is that we can't control the boost. The boost is, is just is what it's going to be. As the engine speeds up, it gives more and more boost. It, the higher speed you go, the more and more boost it gives. There's no control of it. Uh, it's only limited by its size. Um, I don't even know anybody who has a, that uses it. I think you're going to see more of these on a in some very, very old or on stationary applications, generators and stuff like that. But we don't have any, and we're not gonna cover uh, too much more about it other than just to know that it's um, not, uh, they're, they're not ideal. So <clears throat> waste gated turbochargers. A waste gate is, you can see right here, is, is a, just a valve that sits in here controlled by a spring-loaded 
uh, uh, yeah, what I want to say, um, solenoid, and it just, we're either going to control it with pressure or vacuum, and we're going to open and close this valve here and see our exhaust is coming out of the turbine right here. But this wastegate is it exhausts from the volute and just dumps past the turbine. So it's going to bypass the turbine wheel. So we can control how much exhaust is going through that turbine wheel with the wastegate. We can we can dump exhaust so that we can slow the so we can slow the turbocharger down so it doesn't continue to overboost. Okay. That's called a wastegated turbo. And all we're doing is wasting, we call it a wastegate because we're just wasting exhaust energy around around the turbocharger or the turbine wheel. So <clears throat> the reason we have them is we're going to use a smaller turbo in, in that application, that smaller turbocharger is going to spool up faster so we can have, we can reduce that uh, turbo lag because if the, if the a large, too large a turbo, it takes time to not, there's just the inertia of everything trying to get that, that um, turbine wheel moving. So we can use a smaller turbo. It can move faster, but as that thing moves faster, it's going to start, it's going to build boost up and it's going to build too much boost. And so what we're going to do with that is as it gets to a certain PSI, and I have a really good animation here in a minute, gets to a certain PSI, we start dumping that, that exhaust out and we can slow that turbo down and keep it from overboosting. Because right here it says, um, at high turbocharger speeds, the turbocharger may not move air efficiently at, as it reaches its choke point. In other words, it can only go, it, it gets to a certain point and, and it goes too fast. And just so that we can talk about how fast a turbocharger goes, if we overboost a, a turbocharger and it gets, if it overspeeds itself, um, it happen, and it happens a lot, the turbocharger can actually start, the turbine wheel will start actually slinging pieces off it. It, you know, it's a titanium wheel, but it, it's, and it's just little thin fins and they start spitting chunks off them. Okay. They're not designed to go too fast or they just start coming apart. So we want to, we're going to, we're going to maintain its speed and keep it not, keep it from over speeding and over boosting the engine. Um, we already talked about that. Okay, so here's a really good picture of, of the exhaust gases they, as they come through the nozzle. They're going to turn the turbine wheel and, and go out. And if we want to open that to slow it down, as the exhaust gases are coming through the turbine wheel, some of the exhaust gases are going to come and just be dumped right into the exhaust and slow the turbine wheel down. And here is a really good animation if you watch. So we just started the engine. And, and it's just, you know, what we got about five, five pounds of boost on the gauge. We're going to start revving the engine up. We got 10 pounds of boost at 1250. Okay. We're at 15 pounds of boost and we're at what, 18 pounds of boost. Okay. Now we're at 20. Now let's watch what's happening here with our wastegate down below here. Okay. As we speed it up. And watch what's happening with our pressure gauge. Okay, we are effectively maintaining a boost pressure of 20 psi, no matter how fast our RPMs go. And it, and what did we get up there? We got up to 25, we up to 3,000 RPM of the engine, and we still only made 20 pounds of boost. And that's because we have opened this wastegate and we, as the exhaust gases came here that are turning this wheel, we just dumped them past right here and, and just maintaining, just maintaining the speed of that turbine wheel and we can maintain our boost. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Not, it's not very complicated in there. Um, most of the, most of your wastegates are actually going to be connected just like this, you know, straight from um, this is this is your boost that's going to the engine. It's just going to be straight here. You're going to put a hose on here, and the spring in here is calibrated so that it 
so that when it hits 20 pounds of boost or, you know, it, it knows where, what it's looking for and it just starts and it just opens and dumps it. Now we control it on our uh, 6.7s have variable geometry and waste gates. And so in the computer is going to control all of that. So, you know, it may, it, and this is a very crude kind of design in that it's only going to stop peak boost, but there might be times when different driving situations where we don't want super high boost or anything like that. And so the computer, then if we can, if we computer control this with a, in the, in the six, seven, we do it with a vacuum and we can put it through a solenoid and we computer control that vacuum to this solenoid. And we can, we can, in every driving situation, reduce boost, make more boost. We can use it to really tailor everything that's going on so that we can, we can get better fuel economy and we can lower the emissions. Um, and I think emissions are really the driving force for most of this. Um, I think we just talked about that. They're gonna use either air pressure or vacuum to operate. And they're just gonna, and it's just an actuator that's working against the spring. The spring's gonna keep it closed. It, the spring's gonna keep it closed and we're gonna either gonna open it with, um, with pressure or open it with vacuum. Yeah, it's a really good picture. Of, it's a really good picture of one. And the spring here is just going to keep it, keep this against its seat here. And this one here is going to have pressure, this particular one. You're going to put pressure here and that pressure is going to just push that off its seat. Okay. So turbochargers are constructed in three parts. We have a turbine housing, a compressor housing, and the center housing. Um, the center housing is often referred to as the uh, CHRA. It would be the center housing rotating assembly. Um, we used to be able to on the six, I think we still can on the six liter. We had so many problems with the turbochargers that we had the ability to buy just the CHRA, which is the center housing, which that it had the rotating assembly in it. In other words, it had, um, it, it has the housing that has all the oil controls. And then it had the, the turbine and the compressor wheel and the shaft in it. It was just a, a sealed unit that you could buy. And then you could just put the compressor housing and the turbine housings on, you know, just swap them from the other one and put it together. Um, the compressor housing is where the um, inlet and the outlet for the uh, exhaust come to it. Um, some of them have, our six sevens have two ports on them so that the, the both manifolds can attach to it. And then the exhaust pipe is going to go out the center of it. Um, the turbine housing is going to have the volute inside of it. It's going to carry the nozzle and everything to run that compressor wheel. The, um, this is, I think, a picture of the compressor side of this housing. And um, that's what it's called. It's called the diffuser. That little, that little piece that I was talking about I, earlier, I couldn't remember what it was. As the air leaves the um, compressor wheel, it's going to go into the diffuser. And then that's going to open up into the volute and then out to the to the intake manifold, okay? Um, don't know that there's anything new there we need to talk about uh, the volute. This, we can talk about these pieces. That's the snail shell shape of the housing. We've talked about that. Um, becomes The turbine housing becomes progressively smaller as the exhaust travels into the system and that's what causes it to heat up. And then, and then, uh, then the nozzle is the part that squirts onto the exhaust uh, turbine wheel. Um, that's the exact same picture we looked at before, only it's a little bit bigger. Um, and I think, do I need to talk about this anymore? Or do you guys get a handle on what's going on there? Understand? Okay. Yeah. I'm going to move on. Um, there's, there's all kinds of, um, 
you can get into, if you would get into the readings in the book and, and then some of the readings I put out, there's all kinds of different factors that are going to affect how, how a turbocharger boosts its pressure, uh, and, you know, based on its shape and the type of wheels that they have and all of that. Um, however, we're not going to, we don't need to talk about all that stuff because the manufacturers and the engineers design this stuff and you're not kind of redesigning anything. Um, so, um, so this is, this is where we were talking about the inducer is where the air comes in the exducer is where it comes out and, the, and it's the exhaust opposite here. The inducer, the exhaust gas hits here and the exducer part of it comes out in here. It's not on a test that I'm going to, I don't think it's going to be, it's not on the test. It's just part of it so that, you know, you can act smart if somebody ever, ever asks you. Okay. Um, so the center housing and the bearings, there's two different kinds that are out there, the plain sleeve and roller. We're going to talk about the plain sleeve bearings. Uh, Ford does not make any turbochargers with roller bearings uh, right now. Um, they, they're more expensive, but they do work much more efficiently. But um, this is what a compressor, this is what the whole shaft is going to look like on the, almost any of our turbos. And what they are is they've got these bronze bushings that ride in the center housing. They have holes in them and we're going to have pressurized oil is going to come and, and flood these things with oil, lots and lots of oil. We have lots of oil that comes to these. Then you're going to have a bearing here. It's kind of a thrust bearing. that's going to keep the, the shaft in line so it doesn't come around and hit. Uh, I have one, I have a, I have a turbo in the shop right now that I took apart. I just, I just wish we were in person because I can put this stuff in your hands. Um, that it lost oil to its, it, it lost oil. It never, it was a brand new turbo that was put in. Somebody put it in, they put it together wrong and it didn't have any oil coming to it. Probably ran for five minutes, you know, because you, you figure this thing, even at idle, when they started it up, it's, it's turning, you know, 30 plus thousand RPM with no oil in it <laughs> and it seized up quickly on them. But it, what failed is this axle bearing. And, and what happens is that, that bear that that shaft is now walking in there and it and it got itself caught up because this all failed but these bearings the bronze bearings they just sit and they float in there and and this thing literally at those speeds it's it's floating on a film of oil it does not if it was make contact with those bushings we would have failure quickly so they it just floats on on oil in fact when these things are when we test the turbocharger the the you have lots of play in that wheel because it's because there's you know but as soon as it oils up it floats right in the center there are seals in here that are made of cast iron and there's usually two per side and uh, these if these fail we end up with uh, oil either in the exhaust or oil in the intake if they fail and we fill up oil in the intake system the engine can start running away on its oil and uh, you, and you can have a real problem. Um, I had one that had a yet another one today that both bearings had failed. Uh, the bearings had failed and it caused both bushings to fail and the exhaust was full of oil and the intake was full of oil. It was a quite a messy situation. Um, there we go. I think we talked about that. Okay. The, the, Center housings are dynamically balanced. They're not made for us to be able to take apart. We, we can take them apart like that, but they're, they're, they're put together and then balanced so that they are balanced as a unit. And we can't, we can't if, we have a, if we had a compressor wheel on one that got damaged and you had a compressor wheel on another one that wasn't damaged, you couldn't just take them off and switch them because they wouldn't be balanced together. And, and at lower RPMs, it's probably not a big deal, but when you're, you know, and this thing's turning close to 100,000 RPM, if it's not in balance, it will just destroy itself. So you can't, you can't just start messing with them without balancing them. Um, this is just a picture of how the oil comes in. We're, we're going to oil them 
and the oil is going to be under pressure and these things are going to these bushings are going to sit in here and they're just going to flood these bearings with oil and then it's going to um and it's just open hole back to the crankcase lots these these things have lots and lots of oil flow one of the problems one of the failures you're going to get with turbochargers and um we don't have a we don't see a ton of problems with it because of the the you know the makeup of our turbos and the fact that they're water cooled now and and stuff but it's a it is an it, it is a a problem with heavier equipment in that you know somebody takes a big truck and they just pulled a big load and just stop pulling the gas station and turn the the engine off with this thing you know with this exhaust housing could be you know 900 degrees or more and you just turn it off well all that heat in here is just being transferred into these into this shaft and the oil cooks inside here so that's where they have um a phenomenon we call a turbo cool down. So you pull in, you stop, you let the thing idle for, you know, a few minutes, five minutes or something. So it gives that turbocharger a chance to cool down. So you're not just turning it off and letting the thing sit and bake on that oil. Cause it, it will affect, if you start cooking the oil in here, um, remember these bearings have, you know, pretty tight tolerances in there and, and, and they're just a, they're just a bushing and they'll just all that, all that uh, crystallization of the oil will destroy that bearing. And here's some pictures of them, um, how they balance them, so that they're in the <clears throat> so that they're in the right. Shoot, maybe we won't talk very long at all tonight. I'm going through puberty. Sorry. Um, this is how they balance them. They, they 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 grind on the nuts. They grind they grind on the wheels. They do all kinds of stuff to bring those things into balance. So we have some housings, I alluded to that a second ago. Um, all, of our, all of our newer um, turbochargers are all water-cooled uh, on the 6.7s, the three liter, 6.7 and the three liter. The 6.4 and the six liter and the 7.3 and the 3.2 do not have water-cooled turbos, but the bigger ones do. And they just, all they're doing is in that center housing, they're just running water, you know, engine coolant through it. And there's just a picture of, I think, a not Ford engine uh, with, a, with a coolant running through the turbocharger. So lubrication, we've talked about its importance. And here's what the bushings look like when they fail to get lubricated. They start getting coked up and all kinds of problems and um and it just it it doesn't take very long at all and the turbo will fail it says right here <clears throat> excessive oil temperature can lead to formation of brace and compounds and those compounds start to eat those bushings alive these are your cast iron seals that are on here there's usually a couple of them and um they they actually work really good. We don't get, you know, we don't get a bunch of oil in there. Um, just to, um, I think we'll, I think maybe there's a slide, but let me talk about it in case there's not. One of the things that is always misdiagnosed by a, a newbie or a customer is oil in the uh, charge air system. Charge air is the air that's coming out of the turbocharger going in the engine. It's called charge air because it's charged, pressurized. We ventilate our crankcase, all our PCV and everything gets ventilated into that system. So all the blow by gases that are coming out of the engine get blown into the charge air system and then get sucked in the engine and burnt. So what happens is we have, a, we have oil floating oil vapors and stuff floating in that charge air system. If we have a leak or, you know, a hole in the system or a hose that's seeping or something, they will actually leak oil. And people will think I have a problem with my car because I have oil coming out of my turbocharger system. Okay. But that's normal because we're putting that crankcase ventilation in there. If we, I mean, it's not uncommon if we have a, a hole or something in a, in a charger cooler hose, 
you can have a gigantic leak. It looked like you got a big giant oil leak. Well, it's just leaking from the PCB system. Um, <clears throat> what they're talking about here is, is uh, if you're going to install a new turbocharger, you need to make sure that you oil pre-lube the center housing. It's never a bad idea. Um, <clears throat> however, all the stuff we pull out of a box from Ford um, is very well pre-lubed. They, they pre-lube them to make sure because we had problems early on in, in the six liter. But uh, it's always a good idea to make sure that you have oil that, that things because when you first start it up, it's going to take, you know, it could take up to 30 seconds to get oil pressure up there. And we're going to make sure that you're not going to ruin it. Okay, so now air induction system checks. <clears throat> we need to make sure that the uh, we got air, the fuel, our air filters are clean, that, they, they're, that they're correct size, um, that we don't have leaks in our intercooler systems and, and all of that stuff's working. Um, one of the things, one of the things that is really important is everybody thinks that the engineers didn't know what they were doing when they built the truck. And so the first thing some of these guys do is go get the air filter out of there, throw it away and put some cheap k &N filter on there because they think it's going to give them better air flow. Okay. Well, it may very well give them better airflow, but the reason it gives them better airflow, because anybody want to take a stab and tell me why a air filter might give you better airflow? It's less restrictive. There you go. And, and if it's less restrictive, what does that mean? More particulates get into the engine. There you go. All right. So, so yeah, it may be less restrictive and it may give you better volumetric efficiency. It may do a lot of things for that. But one of the things we had lots of problems with, with the 7.3 was a, a thing called dusting. And they will suck in. You could take a, you could take a 7.3 and just let it sit in idle. And it pumped so much air through that engine that if you, if you, if you took a, a handful of talcum powder and just it dropped it in right in front of the air inlet, it will suck that whole thing in, okay? And, and, it, and it, talcum powder will usually go through the air filter and it will suck it all the way through and blow it out the tailpipe. So it, it's, that, it's just like a, a big giant vacuum cleaner. So it's, it crucial that that engine had proper filtering. And what would happen is, is because of its design and the way it, way it put the air into the cylinders, we would, the, the four center cylinders would be really susceptible, especially on the right-hand side, because of the way the air entered that intake manifold. And, and you would, they would get, the cylinders would get dusted and you'd, you'd end up with low compression in one of the cylinders and you'd take the thing apart and you would actually have, you know, as much of an eighth inch to three sixteenths of an inch uh, ring groove or groove in that cylinder just worn out from dust. Like the engine can't handle the dust. And uh, so it's really important that we have good air filters and that there's no leaks in the systems and all that stuff is, is in good shape. Um, <clears throat> it's important uh, when we're diagnosing, we're messing with turbochargers and, and, you know, somebody's come in and complaining, Hey, I'm, my fuel mileage is dropped or, or, or something of that nature. Uh, the seven threes were real susceptible and, uh, to the exhaust collectors from the exhaust manifolds coming up to the turbocharger. They had these, uh, these seals in there and they were kind of, they, they could move around and do some stuff. Well, they would dry up and move and then they would start leaking. And so you would lose exhaust pressure. Okay. So if that exhaust is leaving and going someplace else rather than into the turbocharger and we lose that exhaust back pressure, well, you start losing the efficiency of the engine and fuel mileage goes down and stuff like that. So it's imperative that we not have exhaust leaks before the turbocharger. We need to, we're trying to get all that hot exhaust into the turbo and make it work. Um, people will again start trying to modify and mess with uh, things. The six liter, there must be there must be fifty companies out there making making all these better mousetraps for the six liter, and they just most of them are just 
most of them are just a problem. They don't, they don't work really good. They leak, you know, so you just need to make sure that everything's working properly. Uh, the six liter is really susceptible to exhaust leaks with check engine lights and, and stuff like that. All of, all of them are, but that one especially was, you know, the manifold didn't come with gaskets and they could leak. And if the bolts are loose, so you just got to make sure that everything's, um, um, everything's working as it's supposed to. Uh, this seized back pressure regulators and exhaust brakes. Um, exhaust brakes on engines that weren't designed to have exhaust brakes usually cause all kinds of exhaust leaks because what they're doing is their exhaust brake is, is they're, they're trying to shut off the exhaust and, and make the engine work hard to use it as an engine brake um, to slow the car down. Well, all that extra pressure on the exhaust on an engine that wasn't designed for it can become a problem. The other thing is, is that on our, on the, uh, 7.3 liter engines, they had what they called an exhaust back pressure device. And what it, what its purpose was, was to heat the engine up quickly on a cold day. So if we, if we, if we close the exhaust off and, and make a, make a uh, exhaust restriction, it causes the engine to have to work harder and it warms the engine up quicker so that you can have uh, more heat in the cab quicker. One of the problems with a, with a diesel engine is, is that it's a big giant air pump and it cool, it's, it stays really cool a long time. You could start one up and let it sit in idle for a long time and they just stay cold. So they close off the exhaust to make it uh, heat up quicker. Well, if we have a problem in that system and that exhaust stays, doesn't open all the way back up, now all of a sudden the guy's driving around with an exhaust restriction and it, and it can really have an effect on the guy's fuel economy. So it's know the systems and, and so that you know uh, how to, how, what to look for, okay? Um, I think we just talked about uh, um, dusting and, and air leaks causing problems with the engine, but air leaks and, and dirt getting in there also uh, works on that compressor wheel. And I'll tell you what, I've seen some really, really rough looking compressor wheels and they still work, um, you know, but they don't work as efficiently as, as they could. Uh, but ultimately we wanna keep the compressor wheels clean and working, working good. Um, <clears throat> talked about oil in the charge air system. It's important to know that you're looking for oil and making sure that the oil's not coming from something else, uh, you know, is, it, is the oil coming from the turbocharger or is it coming from the engine itself? You need to make sure that, you know, be able to differentiate between the two so that you're not changing a turbo when you got an engine problem or changing an engine when you got a turbo problem. Um, likewise, uh, you have coolant coming out, okay? Remember, we have coolant that is in the turbocharger. Can can coolant enter the oil or into in, get, can coolant get into the exhaust or can coolant get into the intake part of a turbocharger i would argue that it cannot okay and i guess there's poss some weird possibility that it could but many a people have changed the turbocharger because they've got a water cooled turbocharger and coolant running out the tailpipe well, the reality of it is it's almost always a problem in the cylinder head cracked ahead of it and the coolant just ran, ran through the turbocharger. But, but yeah. So also we're talking about the compressor side and if we have oil getting into the compressor side, you know, we're gonna make sure that, we, that we're not mis misdiagnosing the fact that we have that PCV oil running through this system and not uh, not some kind of oil leak into the into the uh, uh, compressor side. Now, I will be quite frank with you. If you have oil coming into the compressor side, you usually will know you have oil coming in there because it's coming in under pressure, and it's going to have it's going to be usually be a lot of it. And if it's a little bit of it, you know it'll it'll definitely you'll definitely see it, and it will usually cause the engine to smoke or something because it'll it'll be burning that oil. Um, so. There's some pictures of, of oil in the compressor side. Um, 
we just talked about that. Okay, here's some here's a you know picture of bent, damaged wheels. Uh, if you if you experience a uh, problem like this, the, the fix for that is to replace the turbocharger itself. You can't you can't fix that, and uh, uh, not an uncommon situation for for especially on the 6.7 uh, the air filter that sits in there. Um, real common. Some company in China makes air filters. They're cheap, a lot cheaper than ours. And these guys, especially guys that are working in really dirty situations are changing the air filter a lot. It's like, hey, I can get this cheap. This thing's like, you know, a quarter of the cost of your Ford filter. And they stick that filter in, in there and, you know, start driving around. It gets plugged up. Well, that engine, you know, it's, it wants air, uh, lots of it. But what happens is that, fil that cheap filter gets plugged up it collapses the filter and it starts to suck the filter in. Okay. And I've act in, and, and they'll, they'll, when they do, they tear the rubber on them and come apart and they actually suck pieces of the air filter in and they'll go in and get stuck in the turbocharger and ruin the turbocharger. So the guy saved $30 on an air filter and spent $2,000 on a turbo. You do the math. Um, talked about hot shutdowns. Talked about all of that. Okay, so let's talk. We're gonna before we get into some of the other types of turbochargers, um, we're gonna talk about charge air cooling. So I already said what charge air is. Charge air is the air that's coming out of the turbocharger that is above atmospheric pressure. That is considered charge air, and that air is going to uh, now now it's under pressure. What happens when we pressurize, when we put air under pressure, it rises the temperature. What happens when we rise, when the temperature air rises, we lose um, density. And what are we trying to get into the cylinder is dense air. We don't want hot, thin air. We want dense air in there. So we have a, now we have a problem because we're putting hot air, if we don't treat it, we're putting hot air into the cylinders, okay? And that helps, um, and that rises, with that hot air rises temperature and pressures and causes the production of NOx. It's one of the downfalls of a turbocharged engine. So we're going to try to combat that problem by cooling um, the air. And also, also in, a, in its simplest form, we're going to put a uh, radiator in front of the engine and we're just going to pass air through it. Okay. It's an air to air, uh, charge air system. We're going to put air through one side. It's going to be hot as the air passes over that radiator, cools that air down and going to take that cooler charge air into the intake manifold. That's its simplest form. We have, um, most of ours are air to air after cooled. We do in the 6.7 use a water cooled. It's not this water jacket thing. We don't, we don't use any of that, but we we're going to, we're going to use instead of a big giant air flowing across it, we're going to put, uh, we're just going to run a, a, a secondary a cooling system and run cool water through it to cool it down. And just, here's just an illustration of that air coming out of the, Compressor, it's going to come out of it hot. We're going to pass it through charger system, we're going to remove that heat, and we're going to have cooler, denser air going into the intake manifold. Uh, we talked about that. We don't want to lose density. Um, a cubic foot of air, when heated at the same pressure, contains fewer oxygen molecules and weighs less than when it is not heated. The relationship between temperatures and pressure can be predicted, okay? It's one of the beauties of, of God's creation is we can count on the laws of physics. As the temperature goes up to a certain, you know, if we have a certain pressure, we can know that the pressure, the temperature is gonna do the same thing. So we can, we can know that and they can predict it and they can, we can make calibrations and changes around that. Uh, the hotter air gives us poor quality combustion and, and the reason for that is because the air molecules are spread further apart. We're trying to get, we're trying to bring them together. Now, at the same time that we're, we doing all that, 
and we'll talk on next Tuesday, we're putting in exhaust, we're gonna put in EGR into the system to try to spread those air molecules apart to try to control combustion. So a lot of stuff happening here. But power decreases 1% for every 10 degrees of that air temperature above 90 degrees. So it's imperative that, you know, if this thing's, that if this thing's up uh, 50, 150 degrees, then we're gonna have 6% decrease in power and that ain't cool. So also if we have too hot of air coming in there, we can start having piston failures because of the heat. We, the, the engines can't handle that kind of hot air coming in. All right, <clears throat> so the big thing that drives it all is that NOx emissions are produced with those higher temperatures. Remember, uh, nitrogen will, will react with the oxygen at certain temperatures, and we'll really get into that next week. But it causes uh, the, the nitrogen to oxidize. And that is the reddish gray stuff that we see in the atmosphere. And we don't, and, and the tier three, I think tier three emission standards is we aren't allowed to have anything going out the tailpipe. And so this is this charger systems are part of the, part of the emission control devices to help us control that. So cooling the charger has the following benefits. It increases air density. More oxygen contents gives us the ability to have more uh, power, um, more mass in the cooling system, and denser air improves fuel economy up to 5% due to the better combustion qualities. So we're going to reduce our NOx. Uh, we're able to, to have higher injection rates. Uh, we talked about in, injection rates with uh, um, the common fuel system, we really can affect how we're, we're, we're injecting that fuel and at what rate we're doing it. So if we keep the uh, combustion temperatures at the right temperatures, we can, we can have a lot more fun with the rates as they put the fuel in there. So we just get the ultimate power with that charge air system. Okay. Um, I think we need to talk about that. Just another picture of that. So um, most charger systems are nothing more than, than uh, a really just a big simple radiator. Um, one, of the, one of the inefficiencies or one of the problems we have with, with air to air systems is we have to, um, the vehicle has to be moving. We have to have airflow across that. If we don't have the airflow, then then we have a problem. And so that becomes an issue in situations where, um, you know, back East where it's really cold and stuff, people will put uh, kind of like put uh, a bra on the front of the vehicle and, and kind of a blanket over the front to keep the engine warmer. Well, when you start starving the charge air cooler for air, now we can't, now we're overheating those pistons again because we're, we're overheating the air. Okay. So we can't use those with those kind. We've, made improvements in that with the 6.7 and we put a charger it's just a nice little thing it's probably you know the size of a you know maybe one foot by one foot it's not very big but the air goes through and it just goes through a heat exchanger with coolant running through it so now we've got coolant running through it through a secondary cooling system that the temperature of that stays really cool all the time and so now we don't have the problem of airflow we we can have that, we can affect the temperature of that air on that charge air system at any speed. So, um, so problems with charge air systems, we're going to make sure we don't have any cracks, they get cracks in them, they leak. Uh, we have problems with, uh, they sit in the front, they're usually the, they're usually the very first thing in the system, uh, you know, because you can have a, a charge air cooler, you can have an evaporator, or a condenser for the AC, you could have a um, a transmission cooler, you could have a engine oil cooler, depending on the vehicle. And then you start have a, then you have a secondary radiator and then you're going to have a primary radiator. So in this cooling module, you can have tons of stuff up there. 
but the charge air cooler is always going to be the first thing up there. And so if you're the first one in line and people start throwing rocks at you, who's going to get hit by the rock? First guy in line. So it's not uncommon to have a, a charge air cooler come in with something had gone through it, you know, a, a rock or something they, they kicked up, somebody kicked something up on the road and it hits it. And they'll usually manifest themselves as an oil leak because remember we have oil in the charge air system and uh, you'll see, a you know, they'll start to see, depending on the size of it, you could have a leak in there. So uh, it's important that, that uh, we look for leaks and cracks and stuff like that, but it's also important that the fins aren't all bent over and that we have not full of dirt and bugs and everything. We need to get rid of the heat. Um, the hoses and stuff that, that um, connect all of that together are usually going to be a, uh, some kind of a, they're a silicone type of hose. Uh, in here, the, in the literature, they're telling us that they, their color difference based on, uh, on the hot side or the cold side. When I say the hot side or the cold side, it's hot coming out of the turbocharger and then it's cold going in the engine. So you've got a hot side and a cold side. Um, all ours are all ours are blue on the six liter on the seven three some were orange some were black some were blue and and they didn't matter which side of the uh, whether they were hot or cold so there wasn't any differential but some manufacturers might have a differential on them but but they're they're nothing more than um a silicone hose they will they will wear and come apart they'll blow apart they'll um if you get the clamps wrong and the and too close to the edge here, that as this thing these expand because that pressure, you know, causes them to expand. They can cut themselves on these hoses. They'll leak. Uh, remember, there's charge air oil in here, and so you end up with uh, if they're not tight, they could leak. Um, they'll weep. They'll have all kinds of problems with them. Um, they'll they will try to blow off. It's important that when you when you have them off, that you you know. It's not like a, a coolant hose where you put some lube on there so it slides on. These have to go together dry. If you put them together with oil or anything on them, they will they will blow apart. And uh, and there's nothing more exciting than romping on a throttle, wide open throttle, and get the max boost and have that big hose at you know 25 pounds of pressure blow off. It sounds like a shotgun went off under the hood and it's it's really loud. So we want to make sure that they're dry when we put them back together. Um, yeah, a blown off hose or a leaky hose will cause, uh, you know, it could get a hole in them and they could get a hole in the bottom where you can't see it. And it, and it doesn't really open up until it's under boost. And so, you know, it can be missed. You can misdiagnose a turbocharger because you have a low boost issue when actually you have a leak. So you need to be careful how you, what you're doing when you diagnose these things. Okay. So this is just a summary. I think we've covered everything on um, uh, regular turbochargers and charge air coolers. Is everybody, does that all that make sense to you as far as all that was concerned? You know how a turbocharger works now, right? Yeah. Okay. So we're going to throw a monkey wrench in here and we're going to talk about variable geometry turbos. The turbocharger is actually going to work exactly the same as it did before, only we're going to change the size and the dimensions of the turbocharger so that we can, remember we had uh, issues of when it's a, when a turbocharger is um, too big, it takes a long time to spool up, but if it's too small, it can only make so much boost. So you, you've got, you got, you know, limitations with a turbocharger. Well, with a variable geometry turbocharger, we can, we have much more ability to uh, less limitations. However, the reason, um, well, let's just, let's just go through here and then we'll talk about the reasons for this. BTTs are, are technologically advanced alternatives to fixed geometry turbochargers and wastegated turbochargers. Um, BTTs help engines meet emission standards. We're gonna talk about that in a second. They're uh, electronically, uh, VGTs electronically vary uh, input intake boost pressures and exhaust brack pressures by the PCM controls those things. Uh, series turbochargers supply more airflow than VGTs. And we're going to talk about 
variable geometry and series turbos um, and boost pressure boost pressure multiplication in we're going to talk about that in the series turbochargers uh, but I'm, but I'm, but I'm, I want to say read these slides okay so the 6.4 uses a dedicated module that's mounted on a turbocharger to run its variable turbocharger, whereas opposed to our six liter and our six sevens, the, the VGT is completely controlled by the PCM through oil pressure. VGTs can operate as an engine brake. Um, they do that on some of the six sevens. Um, we can use it to ex restrict exhaust flow during cold startup so that we can make exhaust pressure so it'll warm up faster. Okay, so this is important. Primary purpose of diesel engines to, in, in a diesel engine for the variable geometry turbo is to assist, assist the operation of the EGR system. And I'll explain that here in two seconds. Um, We'll cover that in a second. We'll cover all that. So we're going to get ahead of ourselves in that the six point, I mean, I'm sorry, next week we're going to talk about EGR. And does everybody know what EGR is? Do we need to talk about that just briefly for a second? You get, Crystal, do you know what EGR is? Exhaust gas regulator. Exhaust gas recirculation. 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 We're going to put exhaust gas back into the intake system. Okay. So if we want to put exhaust gas coming out of the exhaust manifold back into the intake manifold, should be no big deal, right? We'll just hook it up and make it go in, put it through a valve and let it go in. Well, here's the problem that we run into. We have a turbocharger on this engine and we're putting high turbocharger pressure into the intake manifold. So we've got 20, you know, say we got 20 pounds of pressure in the intake manifold. And if we only have five pounds of exhaust pressure in the exhaust, who's gonna win? We're not gonna put any exhaust into the intake manifold, right? Because there's more pressure here than there is here. So now we have a problem. So they came up with high pressure um, cooled EGR systems. And that includes the use of a variable geometry turbo. And what we can do with the variable geometry turbo is create exhaust back pressure by closing the by closing off the exhaust, and we're going to explain how that happens in a minute here, we're going to create exhaust back pressure in the exhaust manifold system. That's going to increase the pressure of that here so that now we can have 25, 30 pounds of exhaust pressure overcoming 20 pounds of intake pressure so we can push that exhaust in here. So now we have a problem in that we're raising the pressure of this exhaust. What happens when we raise the pressure of exhaust? If we raise the pressure of any air, we're gonna raise the temperature again, aren't we? Okay, so now we have a problem. So now we have to put it through an EGR cooler. That's hence the term high pressure cooled EGR. And so we're going to raise the temperature of this, raise the pressure of this exhaust. We're gonna put it through an EGR cooler. It's gonna cool that exhaust uh, air down, and we're gonna introduce it back into the intake system. Okay, and we'll get into that at nauseum next Tuesday. However, you just need to know that that was the original reason that they developed a variable geometry turbo was to overcome the situation with exhaust pressure in the EGR system. Okay. Um, The boost pressure is controlled electronically. In other words, the computer is going to make all the decisions that are going on. Uh, VGTs have very minimal lag because even though we're using 
that variable geometry turbo to build exhaust pressure so that we can make the EGR work, but we can also use the variable, variable geometry turbo to be able to make the turbocharger spin up quicker and do things so we shorten our lag time, which means if we got shorter lag time means we have uh, fewer emissions are produced. And so we have all the benefits of, of everything because of this uh, variable geometry turbo. Um, I think we've covered that. So, how do, what what how does a variable geometry turbo work? Well, I think I think I have a better slide right here. Okay, so remember on the snail shell, and we had the nozzle in the snail shell, and the nozzle blew allowed the exhaust gases to um, expand onto the turbine wheel, and then the turbine wheel, as the gases expanded, it moved the turbine wheel. Okay, so think about this. If we could take that nozzle and we could change it, remember the um, uh, example of the garden hose and you put your thumb over the garden hose and you can, if you put it all the way over it, you make a lots of pressure and you can stop the hose and it makes lots of pressure and you open it up a little bit and it, and it, and it really sprays out and then, and then you, can, you can open it all the way and it's less, okay we're in a sense going to do the same thing. We have a series of veins around the volute. And so the exhaust is going to come in along this volute in here. The volute, this is just right inside the volute. And the compressor or the turbine wheel is going to sit in here and spin in here. And we can open these up and allow the exhaust to um, blow against the you know, onto the um, turbine wheel, or we can close them and create back pressure, or we can set them anywhere in between. So we can, we can adjust back pressure. We can, uh, we can adjust boost. We can do, we can, we have all kinds of, of scenarios in which we can uh, vary this thing. And that's how it gets the name variable geometry turbo. We're taking what would normally be a, a fixed dimension, turbine housing and nozzle and changing the size of those nozzles. So where we, what that buys us is the ability to immediately get boost and power out of that engine, as opposed to having to gradually build it with a normal everyday old turbocharger. Um, we talked about the fact that it helps support EGR. Um, we can we can get rapid acceleration, uh, shorter lag time, better throttle response causes to have cleaner emissions. We've already talked about all that. Um, and the construction styles have the ability to change the size of the turbine housing nozzle ring uh, exit area. Now, there's a couple ways they do that. Ours are all, all the Fords are done with a, um, vein type, just like I just showed you, but they also have a different kind where they use a sliding, uh, a, a little sliding ring that goes in there and it just changes the size of that nozzle. Uh, Ford does not use that though. And I have a, I actually have an animation coming up, so bear with me. Uh, we talked about that. We already talked about all that. Okay. So, um, Again, here's just a, another picture. We, we, can, we can close down the exhaust here and create a lot of back pressure, or we can open it up and, and put all the gas onto the turbine wheel. So we can have, in it, in it, in it, we, based on engine RPM and how much pressure is in the exhaust, we can, we can change the boost of this thing almost instantly. So there's 10% open. 50% open, 55% uh, closed, I guess, and 90% closed. So we're going to have lots of back, back pressure with a high VGT reading. Uh, we're going to have very low back pressure with a very low VGT reading. And all we're doing is just changing. You can This is a really good picture that you can see that we're um, um, changing the nozzle sizes around that turbine wheel. And we can do that 
from, from at any engine speed. Of course, it's going to take engine speed to make boost, but we can mess with this, you know, at idle, we can make lots of back pressure or we can, you know, we, the options are endless that what the computer is going to do. So, and how they're going to do this is they're going to have, these things are going to be mounted in some sort of a ring up here. And these things are going to, you're going to have usually a, a, some sort of a control linkage to uh, the 6.4 uses a, an external electronic control. Uh, the 6.7, I mean, the 6.7 and the 6 liter all use a hydraulically controlled actuator, which we'll talk about here in two seconds. Um, so here's our, here's our, um, VGT turbo, and as we increase engine load, we can begin to open that up and start to build more boost. So we give it more boost. And we can see our exhaust back pressure is affected by how open it is. As we close them, see our exhaust back pressure goes higher. See, we open them up, we, we drop exhaust pressure and we start to build boost. So, This looks really simple, but as you as you're watching, because we can watch, we can watch how much we're trying to close it. We can watch boost. We can exhaust back back pressure. We can monitor all these things as we're driving down the road, and and the the decisions that the computer is making about you know where the VGT is going to be, how it's operating, is is not like okay, we're going to give it this and we're going to get this kind of boost and. Because there's so many factors that roll into how much boost you're making is, you know, how much load you're under, how, what the engine RPM is, and what the VGT setting is. All these things factor into everything that's, that ends up, uh, you know, manifesting itself in exhaust back pressure and intake boost pressure. And the computers, you know, it's got all these algorithms and everything that it's putting together to make everything happen so that we end up with a, a good, smooth power with good fuel economy and uh, low emissions. So it's actually really quite um, a lot happening in doing it. But this is kind of just a basic picture of how that works. Um, we did talk about this, about the, we're using it. We use an exact exhaust back pressure to control the EGR. We can use it to help heat the cab up quickly. And um, we, can use, um, we can use that variable geometry turbo to build our boost very quickly. And we can change the dimensions of it instead of having to use a wastegate um, to change the turbine speed. We can just start messing with the VGT. However, in the 6.7s, we have VGTs and wastegates so that they have even more control over it. Uh, we already talked about um, EGR, and uh, we'll talk more about that on Tuesday. That just all just is the same stuff. I'm going to get to... I'm going to get to the uh, sequential turbochargers here in a second. We talked already about that. Here's a good picture of how these, um, this is how a 6.7, I mean, a 6.7 a six, and a 6.0 work is these um, pins are pinned into the housing here. And this uh, unit is called a unison ring and little slots slide in here. And as they turn, this ring right and left, these bow, these veins open and close. And this hydraulic piston is, is controlled by an actuator 
that we'll talk about here in a second. Um, so this actuator sits in a turbocharger here and it pushes, it doesn't push anything, I'm sorry. There's a piston that sits in here. And this actuator is gonna control oil to one side or the other of that piston. This piston sits in that, this is that round piston. If we put oil on this side, it's gonna push it that way. If we put oil on this side, it's gonna push it that way. So how this thing operates, cause there's no, Ford does not have any sort of feedback mechanism to tell it where that turbocharger is. It only knows that it has, um, it, it can monitor it by you by reading exhaust back pressure and says, okay, I know, I know the back pressure that I have and what I'm looking for. And so what it's going to do is it has a, a um, actuator in here that we are going to put oil on this side of the piston or on this side of the piston. And what it's going to do is it, there's actually a little cam follower this is, this is a picture of a Duramax, but it's the same basic kind of thing, only Duramax has a position sensor. Ford doesn't, Ford has a little follower. Let me see if, the, let me see if I have a picture of that, I may not. Yes, this is the actuator. So this little cam thing that sits inside there on that, on that shaft, as this solenoid makes a decision to move and put oil to make, a, make it move, and it wants to move at a certain position. As it does that, there's actually a spring loaded little tip on the end of this actuator that rides on this camshaft and it senses the movement. And when it sees the movement at once, it once it, it's gonna make a it's gonna make a, a percentage change here. And as soon as that percentage changes to move that piston a little bit, it's gonna move that and it's going to hit that. Uh, little valve on the end there and that's going to normalize pressure inside here and it's going to stop. Then if this thing makes another change, it's going to make oil pressure on this side of it or this side of it and move it. And once it sees that and moves to that cam position, it's going to normalize the oil pressure and stop. It's kind of a clever little um, uh, actuator. We use it on the six liter and on the six, seven. And, uh, they're actually very reliable. We don't have hardly any problem with them, but is but at the end of the day, what it's doing is it's moving that piston by putting oil pressure on this side of it or this side of it, and it's just this, this little white thing in here is the piston. It's gonna move back and forth, and that's causing those that's causing those veins that were right here. As this piston moves back and forth, it moves that unison ring back and forth, and it's gonna change the dimension of that turbocharger. Does that make sense to everybody? Because it'd be a whole lot more fun for you to have one of these things sitting in your hand and show exactly what it's doing. But this is the best I could do because I don't have you in my front room, in my living room here, uh, showing you how this works. Does that make sense to everybody? Yeah. Yeah? You don't sound convincing. All right. Um, We use a back pressure sensor to just, uh, my, we're, we're just monitoring the exhaust. The computer uses that to make uh, calculations. It's probably the most important calculation on most of them is what is the exhaust back pressure doing? So it can know, so it can use that for EGR and, and everything that. Um, okay, so let's shift gears. If you guys understand a variable geometry, that how that's happening, Let's, let's change our gears to um, series turbochargers. When we say series, it just means we're putting them in line. We have a, we have a low pressure turbo that's gonna feed a high pressure turbo. We're just gonna put, uh, air is gonna come into the engine through a low pressure turbo. That turbocharger is going to uh, boost at a lower, at a low PSI. And it's gonna take that low pressure and it's gonna feed that, that low pressure I'm not saying low pressure, it's, it's still above atmospheric pressure, but it's a low pressure turbo. It's gonna feed that into the high pressure turbo. And then the high pressure turbo is then going to change that to a higher pressure. 
okay? So we have at low speeds, we have air coming in there. So you've got a, a low turbocharger, low, a low speed turbo that's actually spooling up faster at lower speeds. So you have boost at low speeds, but then it's multiplied at high speeds. So we can have adequate boost at low speeds to help us reduce um, turbo lag and, and help emissions at low speeds. And then at high speeds, we have the high pressure turbo being fed by the low pressure turbo. And we can, that's how we can, we can gain those super high uh, turbo pressures. And like I said, I think that some of these people that are using um, uh, uh, series turbos are getting up to 65 pounds of boost, which is a heck of a lot of boost. But we use this engine, we use this design on our 6.4 and on our 4.5. Um, they're pretty reliable turbos. We don't have a lot of problems with them at all. Um, like I said, we have almost unnoticeable turbo lag, uh, great power out of them. Um, they are, they do take up a lot of space. That's one of the downsides of it is it's, is, um, if you, if you take the whole turbocharger setup on a six, four, it's a giant monster sitting on top of this engine. And so it's not, uh, helpful for that but um so this is how this thing's going to work is you have intake air is going to come in here to a low pressure turbo it's going to feed a high pressure turbo and then uh, through a charge air cooler and into the intake manifold um we don't have a we do not use a uh, bypass valve at all on our on our engines um in effect, I think I have a picture of a, this is a picture of a 6.4. The exhaust gases are going to come in to, um, um, up from the exhaust manifolds into the turbochargers here. It's going to pass through the high pressure turbo first, and then it's going to go through the low pressure turbo and then out. But the intake air is going to come in through the low pressure turbo, feeds through this loopy thing here and then goes into a, a high pressure turbo which has a variable geometry turbo on it and then through the charger cooler and then to the intake system okay those are i don't want to get too simple with that but um that's how um what are we doing time wise i need to move uh, but that's how we that's how sequent our series turbos work it's not it's not really complicated um so the last turbocharger i want to talk about is called a single sequential turbocharger and that is what we put in a 6.7 from 2011 to 2014 on the pickup truck models only and what it is is it's uh, a turbocharger that has one turbine wheel and two compressor wheels mounted back to back with each other so we can have a low speed and kind of a high speed design. Okay. It is also variable geometry. So it's got variable geometry, a wastegate and two compressor wheels on it. Very complicated uh, system. It, it has, uh, it's, it's designed to give us better boost in a very tight, compact area. The 6.7 has its exhaust manifolds on the top where normally you'd have an intake manifold. And so the manifold sit up on top, the turbo sits between them. The, there's only small hoses that run from the exhaust manifolds to the turbocharger. The turbocharger is a really tight, compact little unit and it works you know, fairly well. It's downsize, uh, is it, it doesn't handle exhaust back pressure problems very well and uh, it doesn't work well at high altitudes. But it has, uh, um, has the ability to boost up quickly and um, get rid of, we don't have problems with turbo lag on it and it creates a great deal of boost. Um, so let me see if I can show you how this thing works. It has, you can see here, this is just your normal compressor side or uh, turbine side here. Remember I said we have, we have exhaust gas coming in two different places into the volute and this has a variable geometry and they don't really get into this side of it very much because it's just a standard variable, variable geometry turbocharger on the turbine side. But this is where we have our difference is we have a uh, 
compressor wheel that's split into two pieces here. Okay. And they're kind of backwards from each other, but they're, they're still have the same, you know, it has an inducer and an exducer, and this one's just backwards to it. And they're just back to back and it sits on this housing. So we have air coming in here to the low pressure turbo here, and we have air coming into the high pressure turbo here. And so air, um, just this front one works just like a normal turbocharger spins up, goes out and it, and you can't, uh, I got another picture shows where the air comes out, but the same thing happens here is we're just going to make air. So one, one turbocharger is not feeding the other. They're both, they're both feeding the same outlet. Okay. So now we have uh, this one here works really well at low speeds. This one here works really well at high speeds when we need high pressure. So I think, so we have this faster spooling of the smaller turbocharger, and then we can match the uh, airflow characteristics for the larger turbocharger, you know, having a larger turbo uh, air outlet in a smaller package. Um, so here is the outlet. So this is a really good picture of it. The air comes in here on this turbo and air comes in here on the back turbo, and then they both dump out to the outlet port and that just goes to the intake manifold. And the exhaust side of this thing is just a uh, standard variable geometry turbo. Kind of a, uh, kind of a complicated, I've just given you basics of how that works, but it gets really complicated um, how, it, how it produces its air, when it produces its air. And, and like I said, it has issues at altitude. It doesn't work real good at altitude. Um, I don't know the ins and outs of why that is, but um, it, it, I guess it's a, it was a big enough problem. We didn't have a lot of problems with the turbo at all, um, but emissions wise and, and all of that, uh, they discontinued its use in 2015 and they and they went to a huge turbocharger that's probably half again as big as this, uh, but it is just a normal VGT turbo with a wastegate. Okay. Um, I don't know that I'm going to bore you to death with all the summary of this, uh, does that, do you guys have a handle on what, how turbochargers work? I think, I think the most important thing for you to understand is that the, that the exhaust, that the turbine wheel is not turned by the pressure of the exhaust. It is turned by the, by the expanding gases as they come through the nozzle, that expanding gas causes that turbine wheel to move. That's probably the most, the biggest mistake people will have in understanding how a turbocharger operates that that is that expanding gas that works that um, it moves the compressor wheel the compressor wheel makes pressure i mean it's that's all just stupid basic um, the wastegate just dumps a just bypasses exhaust so that it, it, it bypasses the turbine wheel so that the exhaust uh, can control we can control the how much boost it makes uh, super simple as far as that's concerned. The variable geometry turbo, its design is so we can make back pressure so that we can feed the EGR pressurized exhaust. Um, the benefits of that, the side benefits of it are is that we can control and make uh, boost from, from very low speeds to very high speeds so we can control and, and get rid of turbo lag. The same with sequential and our series, sorry, series turbochargers. With a, we can use a little turbocharger, or small, not say little, I mean a, a low speed, low pressure turbo in order to get pressure, um, boost pressures at those low speeds. And then that feeds a high pressure turbo so that we can have, uh, we can have the best of both worlds. We can have the, we can have boost at low end and lots of boost at high end. Um, so that's the reason they're trying to do those series turbochargers. And that's why they were doing the sequential turbocharger in the, um, Ford here in this single single sequential turbocharger was so that they could get um, uh, boot in a very small package to be able to get boost at low speeds and plenty of boost at high speeds. Because remember, we need boost. We need that air in there. A, a diesel engine, the more air we can get in there, the more fuel we can put in. And that just, it just, we can't burn any of that fuel if we don't have the air. And the reason we're putting turbochargers on to get lots of air so we can put all the fuel that we need to be able to, to get the power, power performance, fuel economy, and 
emission controls. Okay? Have I yapped long enough at you? Or I could go on for hours. Does that all make sense? I'm not gonna, labor, I'm not gonna belabor this anymore because I'm almost out of water. I'm gonna lose my voice. So you, nobody has any questions, then we will um, cut you loose. Spend some time in the module, uh, Arturo and Gavin, make sure you watch that uh, lecture on the uh, common rail fuel system. Um, it's, I think it's worth watching. I think it's, there's a lot to understand. There's some good, there's some good uh, animations in there. Get a handle on what it means and how it works. And then um, there's a test for the, there's a test for the common rail and there's a test for the turbochargers in this week's module. And then uh, next week, we're going to, we're going to shift gears and get away from, from the mechanics of the diesel engine and all of that. We're going to start getting into after treatments. Uh, EGR is actually a in-cylinder treatment for NOx. And then we're going to get into all the after treatment stuff, the catalytic converter, the SCR, and the DPF and get a handle on that. We'll spend some time in the weeks ahead uh, talking about how to diagnose some of this stuff. So if nobody has any questions, I'm going to cut you loose. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. All right.